We're really, really lucky and delighted that she could take some time out of a very busy schedule to come and share some insights with you because this is, we've come to the point at the end of the semester where this is really valuable to hear about the things that we've been talking about, how they're applied or what kind of flavor um, is given to those things in industry and in practice. So Mona, thank you so much. No worries. And we'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, hi, my name is Mona, as Sharon introduced. Um, I'm a senior consultant at Telstra Purple. So just give you a little bit of introduction about myself. Um, I'm a software engineer, so I write code most of the time. Um, I graduated in 2012 and uh, spent the last seven years working on various projects, delivering software, building products, helping business solve problems. Um, I also work as a consultant, which means that clients come to us, various businesses, whether it's government, uh, transport, accounting, all different kinds of industries, and they come to us with a specific business problem. Um, it's either to, let's say, increase their profit margin, retain their market share, or some other form of digital transformation. And they come to us with the problem, and it's, we <laughs> gather a team and help them deliver those products. And there's a lot of flavors of Agile in there in, uh, and how we have actually delivered these projects. Um, so a lot of today's talk is going to be sharing some of those experiences. And I guess uh, so there's a lot of value if you ask me more questions and you want to you get more information about what the, I guess, the theory that you learned in the last 10 to 11 weeks, what that means in real life and how we apply. Um, so yeah, just ask me questions whenever, um, just stop me whenever, and I think that'll be more um, helpful. So I guess before I get started, I heard that probably you spent last 10 weeks, 11 weeks, um, understanding Agile, understanding Scrum, um, and doing some projects around it. So before I kind of tell you stories, I just want to ask you, go back to right from the beginning, and can you kind of like talk to me a little bit more about uh, waterfall management, for example? Do you, do you understand what, what, what a waterfall management system is? Anyone? Just throw, me, throw, throw out some ideas. Yeah, exactly. I guess it's sequential. That's the word. It's very sequential. So, for example, I'll tell you one of my projects. So. The CEO of a company came to us, and it's, it's actually a livestock management and meat production company, for example. And they came to us and said, we have a new buyer, a buyer from China. And they like um, the meats to be cut in a very different way. So what they want to, uh, to, to find out from us is how can they analyze what their profit margin will be if they actually took on this, uh, this buyer, for example, and they wanted to reduce wastage. So that's a very, very high level requirement. So they came to us and said, this is what they want to do. So I guess the next question is, if I was to follow waterfall management, what would I do? It's very sequential. So what would I do? Well, how would you do a waterfall management? Yeah, exactly. So it, there's a lot of requirement. Follow, follow the requirement. What I would do is spend probably a first month understanding the system, coming up with requirements, spend the next few months building the product, and then spend the next few months uh, releasing and rolling it out to everyone. So it's very sequential, one after the other, right? So what are some of the problems with that? Do you know what happens when you do a waterfall management? What are some of the problems with that? Anyone? Yes, if you find some problems at any point, it's very hard to go back and trace it. Also, when do you find the problem? At the end, exactly. You find the problem at the very end. What if the project is a two or three year long project? So you find out what's wrong at the end of the project, right? <coughs> right. So the next stage from there is to, so how do we fix that? How do we make it so that the projects don't fall over at the end? Because if you've done some research, for example, there were some numbers around, in UK, for example, in 20, 2005, they, they did a study on 1,000 projects, and only 13% of it succeeded. So there was an 87% failure, and a lot of it was traced back to waterfall management as well. So there was a need for something else, right? And that's when Agile comes in. So I guess, what is Agile then? Like, what is it that, that, that makes it different to waterfall? Prototyping, yes, and releasing it to the clients, would you say? Or prototyping and then building it? Prototyping and building it, yes. Part of it, yes. What is the main difference between waterfall and agile, though? 
It's more dynamic, yes. It's more dynamic, which, also, which means that instead of doing phases and releasing at the end, it's iterative development, which means that you figure something out or you find more information about a particular domain, you build it, and then you release very fast. And then you get more feedback, and then you do the next phase of development. So it's very iterative. So I guess coming from there is one of the very, very many ways of being agile is Scrum. So you've been using Scrum for the last 10 weeks? Yep, cool. OK, so all right. So you're all familiar with the terminologies of Scrum, with daily stand-ups, team charters, definition of done, sprint reviews, sprint planning, retros. Yes? Yes. OK, cool. All right. Um, so I guess what I want to talk you through is take a project that I've done and talk you through how we actually did it in real life. So let's say, um, as I mentioned, the so CEO came to us with this problem. And what did we first do? The first thing we did, say, we did is we got a team together. We went into the business. This was my first project, very first project, and I ended up in the abattoir because I had to understand what actually happens in the business. Because usually, it, it's a very different industry. You don't know much about it. You could go from one industry to another, and the domain is very different from one industry. So you have to understand that. So we went into the abattoir, spent the time with the butchers and the CEOs who actually manage how it works, um, and actually try and understand what's actually happening. And I guess the first thing we did after that is come up with a backlog. So you know what a backlog is? Yes, all, a list of all tasks that you have to achieve. That's your backlog. So I guess once you have a backlog, what happens in every project? You understand about the constraints of Agile or any project management? Every, every project has a constraints, lots of constraints, right? What are some of the constraints that you can think of? Yeah, time and cost. In Agile, we try to, yes, time and cost are fixed, but I'll come to that, yes. It's time and cost, um, scope changes. There's lots of different constraints around that. So I guess once we come up with a backlog, I think the next thing we try and do is find a, a product owner. Every business or every project needs a product owner. Do you know what a product owner is? What, what is their main role? Feedback. Correct, feedback. Yeah, review the prototype. Um, yeah. Yes being, in, yes, being in contact with the customer. All very important, important roles of a product owner. One of the main things, or one of the very, very core of an Agile team is you need a good product owner. Because the product owner needs to understand various aspects of the business. Because what is it that they do? They prioritize. They help you decide what to build next. So they have the, 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 I guess, the absolute control over what needs to be built next and how to deliver the product. <coughs> so a product owner. All right, once we have the product owner, all we do is we have a limited time and we have a limited budget. So what we do is something, come up with an MVP out of that backlog. You know what an MVP is? Yes, minimum viable product. So how would you differentiate the minimum, how would you describe a minimum viable product? All the must tasks, yes. And all the must tasks that adds value to the business. So it's some of the, one of the ways we say is, if a client came to you and said, we want something built, one of the things we use is, you can build a very a minimum viable product, like you can build a Toyota or you can build a Rolls Royce. There's always something more that you can add. There's always gold plating that you can do. But the idea is, you build a minimum amount of features to add value to the business. That's the first thing you do. And you build an MVP with the help of product who decides what's the most important thing. So I guess it all comes back to what your main goal is. All right, cool. So once we have the, the, the backlog and we have the MEP and we have a product owner, I guess the next thing we do is kick off a sprint. So you know what a sprint is? Yeah, how long was you, were your sprints? You, did, you, you had lots of, sorry? Two weeks, okay, you had two weeks. Sprints. Is, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, you have two weeks sprints, all right. So do you know the kind of like the industry standards about like how many, how do you decide what is your sprint size? Depends on the project, yes. And would you, so would you say a bigger project, would you, like how would you say, yes, depends on the project, but how would you kind of say, I'll do a weekly sprint, I'll do a two week sprint, or I'll do a monthly sprint. 
Yeah, it depends on the complexity of the project. I would say the more complex it is, the, the, the less time it should be. Yeah, because you want to you get it out, from, yes, exactly. You want to get it out in front of the client very, very fast. That's the idea. All right, so once we've got um, the idea of a sprint, let's, do, let's go with two weeks because you've all been used to two week sprints. Um, you have a project backlog and you have an MVP, you're about to start a sprint. What do you do next? What is the first thing you do to kick off a sprint? <laughs> You plan the sprint, exactly. Yep, you plan a sprint. So sprint planning, what happens in sprint planning? What is your main thing that you want to get out of sprint planning? What tasks do you need to do with the sprint? Yes, what defines what tasks do you need to do within the sprint? The estimation, yes. You, you, you'll do the estimation after you've kind of decided what you want to build as well. So what decides what you want to build? Sorry? Yes, the team or PO decides what is the sprint goal. Each sprint has a goal that you want to achieve. So in the first sprints, I want to be able to get a product a minimum, like let's say if it's a beta, I want to get my first page out in front of the client, is my goal. So any stories that you pick needs to finish, needs to be in alignment with that goal. That's the first thing. Um, so once you've got a goal, you do your sprint planning. In your sprint planning, now you're going to do stories. You've heard of stories? Yeah, yeah, cool, all right. So. How do you estimate stories? Yeah, using Scrum Poker. And do you know why it's, so you do points? Yeah, it's okay. Do you know why it's points and not days? Fair point, yeah, definitely. For If the task is too big, you can break it down, but you can't change the days. Yes, it's, it's valid. But if I said to you this, how long is, or I want this story in terms of, because well, one thing you'll, 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 you'll witness when you go into the industry is the whichever company it is, is going to ask you, how many days is it going to take you to build this? That's the first question any business is going to ask, because they want numbers and they want dates. But what is the risk of estimating your stories in terms of dates? You don't want to do your stories in terms of dates. I guess one of the things is that, you, in a team, you can have a junior developer or a junior person. You can also have a senior person. Doing in terms of days, it can be very different, depending on who's going to be building it. So, and also, it kind of, the whole thing about Agile is being able to change and predict when you're going to finish something based on data and not starting from the end. So I guess is that if a client comes to you and says, we want this built in three months, on what basis are you going to say that it can be built in three months? And, and then you're going to be scrambling through and working late nights and trying to get the project done. So that's not what the aim of Agile is. You know, one of the values of Agile today is that the team needs to be able to sustain the velocity indefinitely. So a team needs to be able to work at that rate indefinitely. Which means that you need to be able to set up a team velocity, which comes from story points. Have you done any kind of team velocity? Do you know what your velocity is? Over the last 12 weeks? <laughs> do, you know, do you have a number? Do you, have you done team velocities? Kind of? Figuring it out? Okay, yeah, that's, that's a very valid point. Yes, you will do that. Because the thing is, in the beginning, when we go to a, a customer and try and figure it out, it's a, we call it guesstimate. Because we still don't know how complex something is. Right? So we guess. And after the first sprint, you know more. So you get a little bit better at, guess, at guessing. And then in the next one, you get better at that. So the idea is refining, continuously refining. That's what we do. Exactly, exactly. Um, cool, all right, so you, you know about the velocity. You've, uh, as a team, you work together. Um, I guess the next thing is, in the middle of the sprint, the customer comes to you and says, uh, you know what, we now have a new buyer a new requirement, what do you do? Wait for the next sprint, yes, you don't change the sprint goal. So when you wait for the next sprint, how do you capture that? Add it to the backlog, yes. If a, if a new requirement comes into the picture, add it to the backlog. Um, and someone, and next your product owner can come and prioritize that. That's how we work in, 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 in real life, because the idea is that once the sprint goal has been, has been set, you don't want to change that. 
And the thing is, the more volatile an industry is or a business is, you want to shorten your sprints so that you don't have to change something in a week. <coughs> and the team can keep going. Because the team velocity can get affected by a lot of things. Because if you change the stories, team velocity can get affected by that as well. You want to keep your team at a maximum performing uh, pace and keep them going with less, very, very less distractions. Cool. All right. Once at the end of the sprint, we are now coming to the end of the sprint, um, what do you do? Review, yeah, and retrospect as well. Review first, yes. So in your review, who do you want to be there? Who, who needs to be there in a review? Product owner. Product owner, yes, and? The whole team, and? Have you heard the term stakeholders? Yeah? The, what the word stakeholder basically means is anybody who needs to have a say in the product needs to be in the room. And anybody who's going to be using the product needs to be in the room. Anybody who's going to be selling the product needs to be in the room. So your main stakeholders, for example, you're building a product. If, if, you're, if there's a sales manager who needs to be selling that product, they need to be in the room. Because it's, it's building collaboratively with everyone. People don't, the people who are going to be selling the product don't see the product at the end. They need to be part of it. So a lot of the times what happens is any kind of agile project is a journey for any company. And you, usually if you go in as a product owner or somebody who is going to be enforcing Agile or bringing in Agile, you need to take them on a journey. Often it's not an easy change because a lot of the companies can be bureaucratic, which starts at the top and then kind of like trickles down to the bottom. A lot of Agile is very different mindset. A lot of Agile is a collaborative uh, building and there's a lot of uh, autonomy in Agile as well. Um, so it's going to be, yeah, it is, it is a transformation. For, for any business. Cool, all right, so we've talked about sprint reviews, um, sprint retrospectives, um, as you mentioned. Why would you do a sprint retrospective? What do you want to achieve in a sprint retrospective? See what, we, what we've done and what we could have done better, so that we can implement that in the second, in the other sprints which are coming after. Yes, exactly, continuous learning. So you always talk about what did we do well, what didn't we do well, what is our learnings, and what can we, how can we use that in the next sprint and adjust. So for example, like some of the times when we're building an application, we figure out that a framework that we used was very difficult. So we, we found that whatever we estimated to be two days or two points took like five points. So in the next sprint, we make sure that it's five points. So for example, if the first sprint, you, your velocity was 40 points, and in the next sprint, your velocity is 30 points, does it mean that you're not doing well? Not necessarily, yes, exactly, because you might have gotten better at estimating, which is good. So there is a lot of um, variation, not variation. There's a lot of things that are at play that you need to understand to really understand what, what, how to implement Agile, I guess. That's, that's another one. Cool, all right. So we've talked about sprint retro, sprint review. What happens once you've done your retrospective and you're ready to kick off the next sprint? Backlog grooming, exactly. So the next whole cycle starts. Um, so I guess my question to you is, in the last 12 weeks that you've done, how similar was it or how different was it to what I just mentioned? Exactly the same. Great. That's awesome. Cool. Good work. Cool. Um, <laughs> cool. So you're not ready to go into the industry. That's, that's... We'll pay you after. Cool. Awesome. All right. That's, 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 that's really, really good. I guess the next story I'll ask you, I'll throw a few questions at you, different scenarios that we, have, that we have encountered. If I go to a company, and there's various different um, branches to a company, especially if it's a big company, there could be, for example, let's go to a transport company, and it's got its sales, it's got operations, it's got a workshop for managing the buses or whatever it is, lots of different, <laughs> lots of different um, uh, branches, um, and you have to build a product for the entire company. Who is your product owner? How will you find your product owner? Head of each division, good idea. What happens, let's go with that. It's a head of each division. What happens when different divisions come to you and say this is more important and I need you to build this? Prioritize. Sorry? Yes, it's tough to prioritize, it gets too complex. Which you might not find. That's true. Do you think they know enough to make decisions? Yeah, 
Yes. <laughs> it's true, both of that is very true. It, yes, it, it, it's, it's very hard when, when things like that happen because you kind of need one person to make a lot of decisions. Now I'll throw, I'll throw in another situation at you. In a, in a similar company, um, they want to build applications. It's, it's a very huge application. And they want to build applications faster. There's lots of different features to deliver. Um, what if there is three different teams, each following Agile? And they all need to collaborate. Have you heard of Agile at scale? So in the industry, when you work for real, um, what happens is, in the, with, with lots of businesses, if there's 50 people, let's say one of the projects that I work with, there's 50 developers all working on the same product. Um, we don't want 50 people on one team. It's very hard to manage. Usually they say three to nine is the ideal number for agile teams. So now you've got various teams all practicing agile. Uh, yes, they do. Co they have to they coordinate. They can coordinate the sprint, or they can have different timing for their sprints. It depends on the companies as well. Have you called, have you heard of Scrum of Scrums? Yes. So it's 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 it's, so it's in, in the industry that lots of in, in, in there's a new there's a concept that's coming up which is agile at scale, which is Scrum of Scrums. So when you have various different teams following agile but then you all need to work on the same product, you do something called Scrum of Scrums, which means one person from each team goes into the Scrum of Scrums to be able to coordinate the whole thing. Orchestration of the whole work. So that's in another level that you might come across in the industry when you work. Um, so getting the concepts right at your team level and then merging them all back on, on, high, on, on the next scale to be able to coordinate a product is something else that you might come across. <laughs> Um, cool, all right. So I guess um, the next question or, or, or the next thing is, in terms of agile as well, um, obviously a lot of these terms come from a software industry. There, there's been a lot of implementation of that in the software industries. But the current trend is that a lot of companies are trying to go agile, which is outside software as well. Um, for example, Telstra at the moment is trying, as, as a whole organization with like 35,000 people, are trying to go agile. So, you have any thoughts about how you can achieve something like that? Yeah, you can start one department at a time. It's yes. What are the yes, yes? They are starting with one department at a time. But so, how do you change the traditional mindset from a very sorry? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. What, what, what do you think is the biggest challenge in a, in, in a transformation like that? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, you have to look, get a lot of training. When you have a lot of, in a traditional organization, you have a boss who kind of like gives you directions and gets things done, command and control. What happens in Agile is very different. You have your teams doing a lot of it's called self-organizing teams. You've heard of concepts called self-organizing teams? Yeah? OK, yes. So all of a sudden, it's command and control to self-organizing teams dictating a lot of things. So it's a mindset change. Um, and that's a big transformation in, in, in many, many industries. So I guess one of the things. I have a question. What happens with all like, the managers? <laughs> Good question. They have, you, you get different roles. Like Different people need to be able to take different roles. So for example, in a traditional industry, you have one manager telling you what to build. All of a sudden, when you change agile, it comes from design. It comes from what is required. You put it in front of the client, and then you get feedback and change. So your roles needs to change as well. So there is, as I said, managers might not be traditional managers when you go agile. They, they need to be someone who understands agile, who needs to be able to implement agile, and what role they take in an organization and what they do will change dramatically, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess there's, I mean, there's different ways to implement that, right? There's different ways to, I guess the, one of the things is, um, Agile is very good when you have a very volatile industry, which needs to react very quickly. Um, so obviously Telstra owns lots of um, software services at the moment as well, which is easier to implement Agile, and then you have different levels that, that you can bleed into. Um, you start somewhere, and then it's again, I think one of the things with Agile is, Iterative development, but also learn every stage. 
Um, I guess you have to read about the full Telstra strategy, but I think with any company, if it's working, you keep going with it and learn. If it doesn't work, you have to try something else. That's the fundamental things about Agile, right? You have a lot of theory, but what is the core thing about any project management, especially Agile? It's delivery. Yeah, it's delivery. It's, it's, if it's not working to achieve the goal that you started out with, you change. You learn and you change. That is the core of Agile. So you have to think about, is it working for an organization? Yeah, so is, is it working for an organization? That's, that's the first question. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Cool. Um, I guess um, the, the next few things is really, um, do you have any questions for me which I can answer in terms of like, what is the, how, how do you connect the concept and, and, and reality? Anything? That you, what about in the last 12 weeks that you've learned that you had any questions? Okay, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so when does the user story come into picture? I'll talk about a little bit about that. So I talked about backlog. You can have a backlog, let's say, um, I need to build, let's talk about an e-commerce website, for example, a simple thing. One of my story would be that I need to be, I need, as a user, I need to be able to select a product and pay for it. That's a user story. Yeah? So user story is the, is directly linked to some kind of delivery. So, for example, if you were in a different product, but it's a manufacturing product, for example, you would say, as a user, I need to be able to buy this product uh, in a certain state. So that's a user story. But what happens is once you pick up the story, once you know more information, if you think that the story is too big to be able to deliver in a, in a sprint, you break it down. And then it becomes small stories. That's how user story works. I guess, but each story is, is, is directly related to one piece of delivery. That will be done, yeah, that, that, that the team can use and, and build on, uh, can, can use to build something. The other thing is also, there's a lot of psycho, uh, studies that has been done on like human psychologies. When you have user stories that you have to pay, for example, it's like a to-do list. You know, like when you come up with, oh, I need to do this, 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 and this. And when you feel like you move a to-do list or to-do item onto done column, there's a lot of self-satisfaction. It's a team motivation thing. So we always say, break down the story in such a way that the smallest piece of delivery that you can push very fast. We talk about stories like which you need to be finished in one day, not more than that sometimes. Break it down into a very small piece of work so that you can keep going. The idea is to do things that helps you deliver faster. And for example, if I said, um, I need one of, one of the, for example, one of the stories to say, as I said, is as, as a user, I need to be able to pick an item and pay for the, uh, for the, you know, pay for the item. And if I break it down and say, as a user, I need to be able to view something as part of picking. That still adds value to the user, right? So I will just break down the story, pick the smallest story, build the feature, push it out, because it adds value. So the smallest piece of work that, that adds value to the user is a user story which you can estimate. In, 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 in practical, we would say any story that's more complex than a 13, you break it down. That's usually a, like a go-to, that you don't want to have any story that's more than 13 pointer. Really. Yes? Yes, we do build both personas, for sure. Um, usually it comes in the design phase. Um, so, as part of the Agile, you, how does user stories come into picture, right? Like, the, the, what happens before user stories? Somebody is doing research, um, a UX person, user experience person, is doing research, you go into the market and say, what are my users that I'm targeting for this business? And then you come up with a persona. So this is, so I'm targeting, let's say, uh, a 20 to 30 year old professional or I'm targeting a 20-year-old student is a persona. Because when you are delivering the product, it becomes easier to deliver for a, for, for a specific user so that it can be limited. Because what happens is, let's say we are building an e-commerce website, and then you go, I have all these features based on different market groups, right? I would say, pick one, whichever is the priority, and let's go with that. And that, prior, that market group needs a persona. And that's how we build the personas. So the personas comes at a much higher, I'm sorry, much earlier phase than actually uh, building the product as well. 
But again, iterative development, let's say we identified a different market section that we need to go to. You'd go through a persona again. Um, but yeah, that's, like I said, there's different phases. So in a, a, a traditional team, for example, if you're building, let's say, a software product, will look like um, a few UX designers to actually do the market research, come up with the personas. Um, there would be a front-end designer to do the websites and design and everything. There would be back-end developers, and there would be a quality analyst um, who are doing the testing of the application, the product owner, um, and then there would be a few business analysts. So that's how a, a big team would actually look like um, in, in an actual application development. So there's a people from all different areas who come in as part of a team, call it self-organizing team, and they evolve independently as well. Yep. Um, so, well, this, I'll answer it two ways. To be, a, to be a product owner, a lot of the times it's business knowledge, um, to be honest, because that's something that an external person don't understand. And you, as a product owner, need to be able to make a decision to say, I want to build this, I want you to build this, because it aligns with my big overarching goal. So you're making a lot of business decisions. You're prioritizing the, the entire product, basically. Um, in terms of what is the most sought after thing in, in my organization, because it's a very, it, it's a development based organization, consultancy, we all write code. So I guess the biggest sought after in my organization is developers. But that's because, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of the product owners that I work with don't have technical skills. Um, what you need to, what, what I guess you would be unable to understand is because the product owner is really heavily involved in the process. So you are there in the sprint planning, you're there in the sprint retros, you're there backlog grooming, you're there talking to the developers. Because a developer might come to you and say, hey, you know, you want this story built. It's very complex because of blah, 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 blah reason. You know, you need to be able to understand what they're saying. But a lot of the product owners don't have, really don't have, need to have technical skills. Um, it's more around the business knowledge. Um, for example, let's say if you're working in the accounting industry, you need to have accounting industry experience um, to be a product owner. So it, it, it's, it's, very, it's very business oriented, I would say, and being able to make decisions and talk to people from all different arenas to be able to make your call. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because as I said, like, the larger the organization gets, the more people involved in a team which means that you have a UX person to, that, that will work with you, you have developers that will work with you, you have VAs who will work with you, business analysts. Um, so you can use all their skills to get the best for the company. You're kind of sitting on, like, on, this, um, on, on this position where you need to be able to understand how do you draw the best out of your team that's allocated to you. Um, so no, you don't need to have specific skills. You will find people who have been developers before and now in a product manager role. For sure, product owner role, for sure. But it's not unnecessary. I haven't met many who are technical, to be honest. Yeah. Can you talk about the definition of done? Yes. OK. Um, so did you get to define definition of done in your last level? Not, not, not really? OK, cool. All right. Um, I'll give you an example. I'll probably ask you a question. So if I was to say that you need to submit an assignment on 15th of November um, in a PDF format in this building, right? Um, midway through the week, when you've just finished writing your assignment, and I asked you a question, are you done? What is your answer? Not done? Cool, OK. Anybody who would say yes? OK, for all the people who said no, why do you think it's not done? What is that? What does it mean? What is complete? Yeah, exactly. 
Yes, so I would say in that case, the requirement is that you finish your radio assignment, convert into PDF format, you come to this building and you drop it off somewhere where you need to submit or you hit the submit button and it's done. That's the definition of done. So what happens in, 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 in every team that you would probably work with, that you have to come up with the definition of done in association with your team members. Which means that, for let's say for a software product, it means that you've written the tests, you have built the product, uh, product owner is happy with the, with, with the application or with the feature. In some, sometimes it's like the end user is happy with the, with the end user, you've pushed it to an environment, like production environment, and it's being used, is done. So you take, it, you take your feature from all the way along. So it's definition of done. You, most teams will have definition of done. That, that needs to be very clear. Because one of the things, um, anybody who's been a, a developer before? No? OK, one of the things I think that's just a development joke is like, um, we always say it works on my machine. You know? Like, that's a development a definition of that. So it's some, to avoid things like that, it needs, to, it needs to be in the hands of the person who's going to be using it, then you're done. Um, is, again, as I said, the core of Agile is delivery. You need to be able to deliver value incrementally to your clients. And you can, I guess as I said, is like understand Agile and what it means and when it's useful, sometimes like you have to learn the rules so you know when to break it as well. So there's lots of different flavors of Agile that you will see in the industry and Scrum. Um, but the idea at the end of the day is, is it working? Is it adding incrementally, is it adding value to your clients? If that's keep going, otherwise change. That's, I guess, is the, is like one of the core for Jack. Cool. Um, all right, so if, if I said to you that tomorrow you're going to be starting as a, we're going to be working in an Agile team, what are some of the, would you be scared? Would you be afraid that you don't know the concepts? What are some of the questions that comes to your mind? <coughs> no, you, just tomorrow you're going to be starting in an Agile team. You just finished one? Cool, okay, so, sorry? You're waiting for a holiday, you don't want to be on a job team. Okay. <laughs> Wrong time. After your holidays, you're going to be on a job team. Tell me what you like. <laughs> okay, cool. Yes, you can get your holidays. Yes, yeah. What would you, I guess, what do you think is something that you're not sure of what, how to do? What if you were a product owner? Mm hmm. Providing the right vision, yes. I guess um, if you're in a smaller company where um, the, the workload maybe is not too much, you potentially would be going out to the customer, you would be talking to them, doing interviews, based on that you would be making decisions, going back to the customer, asking for more feedback. But if you're in a bigger organization and there's lots of people around, you potentially wouldn't be doing that. So you would have business analysts who would be going on talking to the clients. You would be having UX designers who would be going and actually doing the actual research. And so you would sit a little bit more one, one step uh, abstracted away from all that, that, that work. And I guess the biggest thing for a product owner is being able to get data from all different points where you need to and make your decision based on that. So I guess as a product owner, you have a really versatile job. You have to be able to, as I said, talk to development team, use your BAs, business analysts, use your UX designers, talk to the stakeholders, talk to CEO, what is their big goal, um, talk to other stakeholders and being able to make a decision. It's a, it's, it's a quite a versatile role um, to be able to do that. But again, one of the things with Agile is also, have you heard of a concept called servant leader? You have? Yeah? What does that actually mean? Yeah, exactly. So one of the things with Agile is, as a product owner, you have a lot of responsibility and a lot of power as well, but it doesn't mean that it's command and control. It's a, like a servant leader, where you are trying to unblock people, help people move, and then get their job done in however way. Because one of the things with product owner is they need to be available to their team. Team has a question, product owner. 
you have to be really be available for people to get their job done. You're making them, or you're unblocking them to get their job done. Um, so, I guess, I mean, I keep throwing me questions if you have any, but I guess some of the things, like, I guess, what I would say in probably the last five years that I worked with, different clients, there's a, there's a whole different range of industries. Some, if, let's say if you work with a startup, it's very easy to move fast. Um, less, uh, less friction, there's less people to, 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 to deal with, so a job might be very easy to do. Um, but if you work with a big organization that has, let's say, 35,000 people, like, for example, like Tetra, it could be a big journey. It could take a long time to get there. So you will see different challenges based on different industries and different people and mindset that you work with. But I guess it's, at the end of the day, you remember two things. One is delivery at the core, and second is iterative development. Then, could you uh, briefly discuss the role of learning your experience as Scrum Master role? Yeah, yeah, so I guess Scrum Master is, um, I mean, you all know what a Scrum Master does? Yeah, cool, okay. So in, in, in real, uh, I guess in the actual uh, projects that I've actually done, a Scrum Master has had very varied roles. Um, we have never actually worked where there was a dedicated Scrum Master um, in a team. So a Scrum Master sometimes is like a dev lead team, in, in, especially in terms of software. There's a, there's a dev lead, development lead, um, who kind of becomes the Scrum Master. Because I guess the Scrum Master's role is to be able to liaise with the product owner, and whatever the priorities they're giving us needs to be implemented by the development team. So they understand the problem of the development team, they understand the requirements of the product owner, and they kind of act in between. It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. I think it would more be the team would decide what makes sense for the team. So for example, if there's a person um, who understands what's happening within the team entirely, that person would be the better person to go. Sometimes it could be, it can be interchanged as well. It can be changed. This person, this week, this person will be going. Next person, a different person will be going. But Scrum of Scrum is mainly to get the orchestration right. Especially if there's like, let's say two teams are working on one product. There's a integration bit they need to work on. Yeah. So that's what it would be. So Scrum Master is, uh, yeah. Yeah, big, if, yes, if there's a big thing like that, each team would have a PO. So let's say there's 10 teams, six people in each, there's be 10 POs, or one PO working with multiple teams. But there wouldn't be one PO for 10 teams because they wouldn't have the capacity to do that because a PO is very involved. They're available for, to answer the team, they're, they're, all, they're, they're there. So it could be like in the current project that I'm working at, we have 10 teams, we have six people, seven people in each team. We have one PO who is across three teams. So we have like four POs. And then there's a development manager on top. So yeah, it does trickle down. Um, but yeah, Scrum of Scrums is, is, is yeah, a little bit more complex, like I said, than just one Scrum. But I guess it all depends on the size of the product and the company. Yeah, I guess the thing is like if you have three, let's say one product owner who's working in three teams, it potentially will be in three teams that make sense to stick together. Let's say if, you, if it's a, if it's an e-commerce website, right? You have one company who's working on payment module, for example, and then the, there could be three teams working on just the payment module, module, and there'll be one product owner for that. There could be one team working on displaying the products. There could be one team working on a cart functionality. You see, like what would make a logical sense? It, it depends on orchestration. This is when more coordination needs to be there between the teams as well. Um, yes, Scrum of Scrum is not the easiest thing. Uh, we are talking about scaling agile. Um, there's more complex, I guess, if you have problem with five people, scale it to 50 people. That's the problems you'll see in Scrum of Scrums. But I guess if you understand the basics of Scrum in one team, it's not that bad to scale. Yeah, it depends. Each team is each team is an individual entity as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Cool. 
Cool. All right. So we've got another, just like five minutes. Is there any questions you want to ask me? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I guess what happens is, yes, we are doing Scrum, for sure, on all the projects that I've done. What happens is each sprint, if a bugs come up, we say, we're going to dedicate 20% of our time for maintenance of an application, which is bug fixing and everything. So we still do 20% of the time in there, but the rest of them is still built on feature development. Yeah, as a maintenance, yes, we do. But sometimes what we've also done is we have a separate team to do maintenance, for example who manage the applications. And the, the main team does not manage the application. The main team would just add features. So that would be two different Scrum teams again to work. We do, but it depends on what makes sense for the, for, for, for the project and how many people are available as well. Yeah, so, so far I haven't worked on a project where I thought it didn't work out, to be honest, but I've definitely had lots of challenges. Um, I think one thing I would say is when you take a job onto a, like a far side, is when, I guess one of the things that I've seen is when there's so much autonomy that orchestration becomes very hard. Um, we're talking about Scrum of Scrums. So we say, yes, each team needs to be able to self-evolve and needs to have the autonomy to decide, but what if each team is so autonomous that they can't orchestrate well is one of the problems that I've seen. When you have a big team, coming together becomes hard. Um, because, for example, one team can say, I'm doing Scrum. Another team can say, I'm doing Kanban. Uh, Lean, if you're, you do know how Kanban is. It's an, another, another project management method, which is much more looser, um, loosely implemented. Um, anyway, it could be different project management uh, styles. And they can have different varying times so when you orchestrate, orchestrate. So you've heard of a, I mean, you, have you looked into how Netflix or Uber works? It's, uh, or Spotify. So all of those uh, companies use Scrum or Scrums because they're very big and they need to be able to coordinate uh, these things. So one of the things that you will see is for autonomy, it could be one team, for example, could be using different technology stack. Um, and they all come together at the end to build this massive application that Netflix is or Uber is. So orchestration becomes very hard. And agile at scale is hard. That's something that I've definitely seen. Um, the second thing is, if you have to go, for example, if you have to go into a much more traditional organization, um, agile is harder because it's a mindset change. Um, that is something you will have to work with the organization. What I've seen is, when I land on the first day, agile is hard, very hard. What you have to do is take them on a journey, which will take time. Because one of the things, best things that you can prove with agile is fast delivery and reliable delivery. So once the clients see that, they adapt, they change, but that can take time. So I think the biggest thing in any project that you land is gaining trust and showcasing that your, your method works and why it works. And as the clients see that, they change over time. So it's, it's a little bit of a journey. So if you land on the first day and everybody says agile is bad, then don't be disheartened. Uh, they might be on, on, on a journey as well. Uh, but in the last five years, I, I haven't worked on a project where Agile didn't work. I've definitely used waterfall method um, in, in a smaller project. I had to do a, a project in two weeks. I had to build something in two weeks. Two weeks is too short a time to actually implement Agile and go through the whole process because there's a lot of ceremonies and there's a lot of things to implement in an Agile. So in two weeks, when I had to build something, I used waterfall. Because waterfall is good. It's not, it's not, not all bad. Waterfall is good in when requirements are very clear. It's a very simple application. It's a small thing to build. Waterfall is perfect when things don't change too much. Agile comes into picture when it's a bigger project. There's more variables. It's more complex. And it's over a longer period of time. That's when Agile is useful. So don't uh, put off like waterfall. Know when to use that um, and when Agile actually makes sense as well. OK, I'm conscious of your time more. Huh? So, okay. yeah, so uh, thank you so much no for worries. taking the time out. And I know that everyone really appreciates it after a long day's work. And she was here earlier on talking to Ariana. So 
well. So this is a big time commitment when you're working with Agile, as you know, time is precious. We <laughs> know this. So we have a little something to help you relax when you get home. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> From class. I'll take you